anybody in the whole scope of the kingdom. He, he is ruler of all. But there's also another sense in which this kingdom is exclusive. Those of us who are in Christ are willing participants in this work. We have entered into it as laborers together with him. We do not have to be beaten into subjection and made to bow before him like the unrepentant masses will on the day of the Lord. Now this kingdom of his dear son is not a synonym for the church, although it involves it. It doesn't only involve men. It involves angels and principalities and powers. It involves the Holy Spirit, Christ, and God himself. This kingdom is the means by which Christ is building his church. The kingdom is the umbrella under which the power and the authority has been granted him to impart unto his servants the grace and power that's needed to accomplish this purpose. Ephesians said it this way in Ephesians uh, 1, 19 through 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, that is speaking of God, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, in this place of authority, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not in this world, but all, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all Amen. now i'm not sure exactly how those who preach the rapture of the church in a time when christ returns to earth to set up his kingdom fit this text in their to their theological template and i don't i'm not really sure that i want to know all that I can say is that one would have to consider very highly the words of contemporary authors and preachers over the words of Christ himself and the, what the apostles have to say about this subject. As this text in Ephesians confirms, Jesus has presently been given a kingdom and is presently exercising the authority that has been given him. Amen. Now, this is not merely a point of doctrine, it's a reality. And it's imperative that we see it as so. Because without a clear view of this, we are sure to be discouraged very easily. This is because this purpose that the Lord is working out amongst us is a purpose that requires a reigning Savior. We have an adversary, brethren, as well as a whole host of demonic personalities who would seek our eternal ruin. Any one of which is infinitely more powerful than any man. If it were solely up to us to ensure our retainment and continuance in the things granted to us in salvation, we would do, be defeated in a moment of time. However, we know that we can have confidence in the power of God to keep us as we have been promised in Scripture that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We know that he is reigning because if he were not, we would not be able to stand. As of the present, the reign of Christ can be evidenced by the condition of his people. His superiority is being demonstrated every time his people overcome the temptation and opposition of the wicked one. The righteousness of his people and their holy conversation in the world is the evidence of his grace reigning over the powers of darkness. Now this purpose is one that required that the one who sets the captives free have more authority than the one who would keep the people in bondage. It is for this reason that the Savior is called to be the captain of our salvation. Amen. This means, brethren, that whatever is required for you to make it from here to there, Christ has the power to grant it to you. He came down to earth in the form of a man and learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And in this, he gained the capacity to be a merciful and a faithful high priest. He died to take away the sins of the world and rose again from the dead, triumphing over the grave. He ascended to the right hand of God. And there at this position of power and authority, he is interceding continually on our behalf before God. Not only has he done everything that was required to secure your salvation in terms of creating the atonement and making a way to escape the corruption of this world, both in personal defilement and in the molestation of the principalities and powers that we have all around us, but he has been put in a position where nothing is able to hinder him from giving these provisions to you if he is determined to do so. This is his kingdom. He has invested all of himself in it. 
His prerogative, therefore, is to bring the purpose for which it was entrusted to him to fruition. Yeah, that's right. So in addition to being confident in the work that he did to save you and the power he's been given to be able to grant you this salvation, you can be confident that he is forward to use this power. Yeah. He has authored your faith, and if you continue in it, you can be sure that he will finish it as well. Amen. So in closing, brethren, I exhort you to consider not only the things that you've been delivered from, but to continue to seek first the kingdom that you've been translated into. Let us not ever find ourselves giving in to the temptation to think that because we're not involved in gross iniquity that we can be lazy about our lives. We have been called with a holy calling. We have been called unto a heavenly kingdom. It is this hope that we have as an anchor of the soul, not just that we might be rid of these vile bodies, but that we might have a glorious body like unto his. Not just free from the hindering influence of sin, but free to, without restraint, give our whole heart, mind, soul, strength, and body to our God. Thank you, brother. Amen.